In her September 2004 science paper, Jessica Sunshine writes, The strongest three micrometer absorptions in the deep impact data occurred at the North Pole. And We estimate the water content at approximately 0.3 weight percent. This works out to be 3,000 parts per million of water, half of what was detected in the Apollo samples. The lunar poles are the only place where you can get water on the moon. Webb's own Space.com article states repeatedly how the signature of water detected was always stronger towards the poles. In fact, Roger Clark in his science paper stated that the water content for the non-polar regions of the moon was so low that it didn't even register in Chandrayaan-1's M3 data. And yet, the Apollo samples supposedly collected from these much drier equatorial regions of the moon show water contents as high as 6,000 ppm, as indicated by Larry Taylor and company. This is twice the maximum amount of water one can even get in the only place on the moon where you are likely to find water. I suppose NASA will suddenly claim they collected these samples from the polar regions now. Remember, Webb assures us that the total amount of water detected in terrestrial rocks is 0.2 to 1%, or 2,000 parts per million to 10,000 parts per million. The trace water detected in the lunar basalts when they first arrived on Earth amounts to less than one hundredth of a percent by weight, compared to two tenths to one percent by weight for their terrestrial cousins. Another big quantitative difference. Well, kids, if the water content in the lunar rocks is in fact 6,000 parts per million, this equates to 0.6% by weight, which sits nicely above the lowest amount of water detected in terrestrial rocks. So much for there being a big quantitative difference between Earth rocks and Apollo samples. The printed picture in the Nature.com article was even captioned, Appetite grains in basalt sample contain as much water as has been found in some volcanic rocks on Earth. Ironically enough, even lunar scientists had doubted that there would be any water on the moon based on the supposed absence of water in the Apollo samples. In the September 24th Science Magazine article, A Whiff of Water Found on the Moon, Spectroscopists have long distrusted any sign of water in lunar data because Apollo moon rocks were so bone dry. And in the Physorgs.com article, Deep Impact, Moon Mineralogy Mapper finds clear evidence of water on the moon. In the Deep Impact data, we're essentially watching water molecules form and then dissipate right in front of our eyes said Jessica Sunshine of the University of Maryland, who said her first reaction to the M3 data was skepticism. My reaction is also skepticism. For final recap, in 1970, scientists find up to 455 parts per million of water in the lunar rocks and an additional 810 parts per million of water in the lunar regolith supposedly brought back by the Apollo astronauts. For decades, NASA brushes this off as contamination. That is until scientists confirm the presence of 46 parts per million in lunar spherules and estimate as much as 260 parts per million to exist in there. Now NASA tells us that their more recent moon flights have confirmed 3,000 parts per million of water in the lunar polar regions and virtually non-existent water in the equatorial regions. Even though the detected water, if it exists, is by no means comparable to the vast quantities of water found in the Apollo samples, propagandists have desperately exploited this data to prop up their precious rocks. While at face value, their use of this incomparable data may appear to confirm NASA's Apollo samples, it ultimately calls into question the giant impact theory which was specifically proposed to account for the identical properties and the alleged lack of water. There are three other theories for the moon's origin, two of which have been rejected because they are not substantiated by the samples allegedly collected by Apollo astronauts. And the third theory had its own set of flaws completely unrelated to the samples. To be truly blunt, 
Anyone who claims that this Cassini, Chandran 1, and Deep Impact data proves that these water-riddled stones are indeed from the equatorial regions of the moon, has effectively shot themselves in the foot. In August 2010, Zachary Sharp came to NASA's rescue. After performing studies on chlorine isotopes, his team concluded that any water found on the moon was simply deposited there by comet impacts. Professor Sharp discussed this in a recent science podcast. There is water on the moon. It's recently discovered by remote sensing satellites. It's almost certainly of cometary origin where the comets slam into the surface of the moon and the ice just resides in the dark shadows for thousands of years. This was also reported in the ABC online article, Lunar Rocks Yield No Water. A new study of rock samples collected during the Apollo missions has concluded the moon is almost bone dry. The research published today in Science Express means the only water on the moon was most likely deposited by comet or asteroid impact. Dr. Trevor Ireland from the Australian National University in Canberra says the findings confirm the moon is as dry as previously thought. The insides of the moon are very dry, says Ireland. The new results mean the water that reached the moon from comet and asteroid impact is most likely the only water there. He says the result is also consistent with the planet impact theory used to explain the moon's formation. The moon lost all the original water which evaporated away during impact, and so couldn't condense, says Ireland. Sharp's study in question was published in the August 27, 2010 issue of Science. He summarizes the result in the opening paragraph. Arguably, the most striking geochemical distinction between Earth and the Moon has been the virtual lack of water, hydrogen, in the latter. This conclusion was recently challenged on the basis of geochemical data from lunar materials that suggest that the Moon's water content might be far higher than previously believed. We measured the chlorine isotope composition of Apollo basalts and glasses and found that the range of isotopic values from minus 1 to plus 24 per mil versus standard mean ocean chloride is 25 times the range for Earth. The huge isotopic spread is explained by volatilization of metal halides during basalt eruption, a process that could only occur if the Moon had hydrogen concentrations lower than that of Earth by a factor of approximately 10,000 to 100,000, implying that the lunar interior is essentially anhydrous. At the time, the press lapped up Sharp's findings. But it seems that Sharp's efforts to defend the giant impact theory were in vain, because the chlorine isotope composition was reanalyzed by Eric Hurry's team in 2011, and it turns out that the chlorine isotopes in the Apollo samples were comparable to those of Earth after all, the results of which were illustrated in this simple chart plotting the chlorine to water ratios. The orange circles represent the lunar samples, and the grey field represents the data for the melt inclusions from the Sekiro's fracture zone on the East Pacific Rise, as an example of depleted mid-ocean ridge basalt, or MORB for short. It's rather obvious that the majority of these Apollo samples have identical chlorine to water ratios as their terrestrial cousins. Eric Hurry and company directly responded to Sharp's study in their May 26, 2011 Science Express article. We estimate lunar mantle volatile concentrations of 79 to 409 parts per million H2O, 7 to 26 parts per million fluorine, 193 to 352 parts per million sulfur, and 0.14 to 0.83 parts per million chlorine. These estimates overlap most estimates for the volatile content of the terrestrial MORB mantle, and are much higher than prior estimates for the lunar mantle, based on the volatile content of lunar appetite and the variation of chlorine isotopes in lunar rocks including the sample 74220 that we have studied here. The melt inclusions indicate definitively that some reservoirs within the interiors of the Earth and the Moon not only have similar water contents, but also similar contents of fluorine, sulfur, and chlorine associated with this water, a volatile abundance signature shared by both bodies. 
These results show that the Moon is the only planetary object in our solar system currently identified to have an internal reservoir with a volatile content that is similar to the Earth's upper mantle, and that prior estimates of the lunar inventory for highly volatile elements are biased to low concentrations owing to the degassed nature of lunar samples thus far studied. The Moon has erupted a wide variety of magmas during its history, and it remains to be seen if other lunar mantle sources are as volatile rich as the source of Apollo 17 high titanium magmas. Nevertheless, the hydrated nature of at least part of the Moon's interior is a result that is not consistent with the notion that the Moon lost its entire volatile inventory to the vacuum of space during degassing following a high-energy giant impact which would be expected to leave a highly desiccated lunar interior. So once again, the giant impact theory fails. Even if we overlook the identical chlorine contents between the terrestrial basalts and Apollo samples, the idea that lunar water got there through comet impacts is still flawed for a number of other reasons. Firstly, comet water collecting on the moon during impact does not explain how water was able to get inside the glass spherules. These spherules were supposedly created during lunar volcanic activity, and as such would have sealed in all their goodies long before the comets impacted and delivered their water to the lunar surface in the first place. Second, as stated previously, in the vacuum of space, the boiling point of water is lowered to less than 26 degrees Celsius. In daylight temperatures above 100 degrees Celsius, any water collected on the lunar surface would quickly vaporize. Comet water might be able to accumulate in the polar regions where craters are permanently shadowed and thus are in minus 100 degrees Celsius temperatures for years, but the Apollo rocks which were supposedly collected from the more equatorial regions of the moon would not have that luxury. Remember, objects in broad sunlight tend to heat up very quickly, and a day on the moon lasts a month. Thirdly, the oxygen isotope ratios. If we go to the Space.com article that Webb showed at the end of his video, we find that lunar geologist Larry Taylor was quoted to saying, The isotopes of oxygen that exist on the moon are the same as those that exist on Earth. So it was difficult, if not impossible, to tell the difference between water from the Moon and water from Earth. Oxygen isotopes will be discussed a bit later on, but here's a quick teaser. Webb claims the oxygen isotopes would be a dead giveaway if NASA used regular meteorites to pass off as lunar material, because regular meteorites have a different ratio of oxygen isotopes than those from the Earth-Moon system. We'll see about that a little later on. What I find interesting is that scientists never used this logic when testing their comet water excuse. In 2004, NASA's Stardust space probe collected dust samples from the tail of Comet Wild 2. When scientists analysed the rock, they found the oxygen isotopes were vastly different to the Earth-Moon system. This is revealed in the Astronomy.com article Comet dust reveals unexpected mixing of solar system. Chemical clues from a comet's halo are challenging common views about the history and evolution of the solar system and showing that it may be more mixed up than previously thought. A new analysis of dust from Comet Wild 2, collected in 2004 by NASA's Stardust mission, has revealed an oxygen isotope signature that suggests an unexpected mingling of rocky material between the center and edges of the solar system. Despite the comet's birth in the icy reaches of outer space beyond Pluto, tiny crystals collected from its halo appear to have been forged in the hotter interior, much closer to the sun. The results, reported in the September 19th issue of the journal Science by researchers from Japan, NASA, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, counters the idea that the material that formed the solar system billions of years ago has remained trapped in orbits around the Sun. Instead, the new study suggests that cosmic material from asteroid belts between Mars and Jupiter can migrate outward in the solar system and mix with more primitive materials found at the fringes. In the September 19, 2008 science article in question, we find that the oxygen isotope ratios of comets are more consistent with that of carbonaceous chondrites. 
Anyone else see a problem with the comet excuse for the lunar water? Apollo rocks have oxygen isotopes restricted mostly to those of the Earth-Moon system, whereas comets have oxygen isotope signatures that fan out across the farthest corners of the solar system. If the water found in the Apollo samples were of comet origin, the oxygen isotopes should have given a clear indication.